Polygram decided to release a greatest hits record in Europe only that was to be called Killers. A collection of Kiss Killers! The craziest American heroes ever! Ranging through an amazing career comes an amazing collection of Kiss! We needed four new songs for it, so we got together with a producer named Michael Jackson, whom Paul and I liked very much. He came from a different musical background, but had some good ideas. He had produced Jesse Colin Young from the Youngbloods, one of my favorite bands. On meeting him, I strongly urged him to do something about his name. I mean, two Michael Jacksons just wouldn't fly. I suggested Michael James Jackson, and he did change it to that. The writing process started. It was clear things would be different. Ace was nowhere to be found. We would deal with that issue when and if we had to, but for now we had work to do. Kiss moved to Los Angeles, where Jackson was based. Paul and Eric rented places, and I moved into Diana's Beverly Hills home. I was completely distracted by Hollywood and movies, and my songwriting as a consequence suffered greatly. The four new songs were all written by Paul and co-writers. One of Paul's songs needed a bridge, so I suggested a melody line he didn't care for. I saved the melody and would later reuse it as the centerpiece of a song called I Love It Loud. By 1981, I was spending more and more time in Hollywood. I was approached by Marcy Carcy, a producer of shows like The Cosby Show and Roseanne, to try out for a show to be called Grotus. I would be the star. I shot a short pilot, and everyone seemed to like it enough to get me in front of the ABC staff. There were ten people around a table, and we chatted for five minutes. Then they offered me my own TV series. I was stunned. I went outside with my business guy, who explained the deal to me. I would get $60,000 an episode. He told me if I left KISS, where I was making substantially more, I would in essence be paying for the privilege of being on television. A coin in the band were not happy with me being on TV. This confirmed for them what they told me earlier, that I had gone Hollywood, the worst thing you could do back then. The band was in turmoil. Ace was miserable, a coin was slacking, Eric was disillusioned, and Paul felt betrayed by my interest in television. And my fans weren't happy either. The press was having a field day talking about the beast from Kiss, who was dating the Motown diva. The fans turned on me because of it. If I had wanted to live my own life, and if this was the price I had to pay, so be it. But in the end, I didn't do the TV show. I stayed with the band. Finally healed, I cut my hair short and started hanging out in an Upper West Side watering hole called Cafe Central. I decided to take a break from spending time in music circles. Cafe Central was more of an actor's hangout, a bar with tables, and people spent entire nights table hopping. Regulars included Christopher Reeves, Peter Weller, Raul Julia, and Al Pacino, and Bruce Willis was a bartender for a time. If musicians bored me with talk of gear and guitars, I soon found out that most of the actors I met wanted to talk about only themselves. They seemed to endure listening to their peers only so they would get a turn to talk about themselves. Still, I welcomed the change of scenery for a while. I started going to the theater almost every week. I had a ticket broker, and I'd call and say, What have you got for tonight? 
I found it interesting that so many people in New York, myself included, talked about the culture of the city but never actually experienced it. Here was an opportunity to do it. I went to see whatever was playing, from the big production British musicals like Miss Saigon, Cats, and Les Miserables, to more serious plays like American Buffalo, Waiting for Godot, and Death of a Salesman. I took some acting classes, too. I sat in on Lee Strasberg's classes once or twice. At one class, a woman got up to do a scene in front of him and broke down crying before she started the scene. This is nuts. I thought you acted from joy, not torment. Strasburg's wife, Anna, took a liking to me, and I went to a few parties at their house. I came away with the impression that none of these people wanted to be happy because they feared it might compromise their acting ability. They had to be brooding and miserable, and hence everyone in the room seemed to be under his or her own personal dark cloud. I felt as if I should have taken an umbrella. This is not for me. One night when I was out at a restaurant having dinner, the actress Donna Dixon and a model friend of hers walked in. Donna was staggeringly attractive, so much so that it was intimidating. So much so that I went for the woman who turned out to be her roommate. Donna was just too beautiful. But after I had seen her friend a few times, I admitted to myself and to her that I was actually interested in Donna. And somehow it worked. I started seeing Donna. I loved having such a gorgeous girlfriend. As superficial as it may have been, she was beautiful in a way that made me happy. With hindsight, I can see that dating her was clearly another example of my trying to eradicate my own imperfections by being with someone seemingly perfect. Anyone who could date a woman who looked like that must be special. But at the time, I was very taken with her. When she entered a room, the room came to a halt, and I was with her. Donna had landed her first big role starring opposite Tom Hanks in the TV show Bosom Buddies. She shuttled back and forth to L.A. for that, and we continued to see each other. During this time, Ace announced he wanted to quit the band. I drove up to his house in Westchester and spent the day with him. We went to the mall, drove around, talked. Don't leave, I told him. Stay in the band. I need to go, he said. I found out years later that he didn't remember I had been there. Many pages of Ace's past are now blank. That's how blasted he was. He was living in a constant state of blackout. Bill worked out a deal to let Ace leave, but have him make promotional appearances for the next album, which we planned to make in Los Angeles. In some ways, I was glad Ace finally left. We couldn't go anywhere with him the way he was. Everybody around the band seemed to be suffering from the same disease. It's one thing to be useless. It's another to be a detriment. Bill had gone from sharing office space with Howard Marks Advertising to first having one floor and then two floors of a building on Madison Avenue, plus a Los Angeles office. He had people developing film projects and dozens more people on the payroll. I had no idea what they all did. He had a huge luxury apartment near St. Patrick's Cathedral that he'd spent a fortune decorating, but that he rented rather than owned. He was now making such bad decisions that I often followed up on meetings he had on our behalf. What did he agree to, I'd ask. Then I'd have to nullify things. It was clearly the drugs. Eventually, his drug habit became so all-encompassing that he could no longer go to the office. He was home freebasing, holed up with a pipe. When things change incrementally, sometimes you don't realize how far you've gotten from where you started. That's basically what happened with Bill. When I looked at him, he still appeared to be the person I knew. When he was lucid, he still sounded like the person I knew. But he wasn't that person anymore, even if it took me a long time to recognize that fact. Bill had gone from being our visionary mentor, our manager, a father figure, a fifth member of the band, to being a delusional, drugged-out whack job. It was so bad that heart-to-heart -heart talks I had with him went nowhere except to confirm the worst. What are you doing, I'd ask him. You're spending all your money. I don't care, he'd reply. I made it once, and I can make it again. It was a reckless attitude, and it mirrored Ace and Peter. They all took things for granted. Watching all these guys go down the tubes with drugs or booze, seeing their demise, I realized that it's all a question of what people do with the freedom that success affords. There were times when Gene wanted to have company in his stance of, we don't drink or take drugs, but that wasn't my stance. 
I had nothing against drinking, and I had smoked pot when I was younger. But when I saw what the Casablanca office turned into, what Bill turned into, or what Ace and Peter turned into, I didn't think that transformation was just the luck of the draw. They made their own destinies.